to San Francisco to become the editor of the left-wing magazine, Mother Jones. I intend to, I think, get back to the old days of muckraking journalism here to return Mother Jones to its hell-raising roots. After only five months, he's fired. The people at Mother Jones want to forget the entire episode and all the bad publicity they got from dumping Michael. It's a particular sore spot in its history, the left eating its own. I was surprised that 20 years later, people were still this upset about Michael Moore. People that I knew there that I had hired and worked with for years were telling me the guy was just impossible, and they were demoralized. There was a meeting of the staff, and Deirdre English, whose place he was taking, was there, and he kind of basically trashed the magazine in no uncertain terms. The whole Mother Jones episode in Michael Moore's career is quite an interesting one, and one that he has portrayed very successfully, that he was simply too honest and too real for the effete intellectual liberals at Mother Jones. There's a big cultural chasm that has long been a part of left politics in America. This cultural clash became quickly intolerable, particularly to the management of Mother Jones. And it expressed itself in ways that did concern debates over editorial content. After Michael is fired, he sues Mother Jones for $2 million and wages a national PR campaign against the magazine and the press. On August 5th, I was ordered by Adam Hochschild, chairman of the board of the foundation that owns Mother Jones, to publish an article on Nicaragua that said, in essence, that the Sandinistas are a group of Leninists. I obviously didn't get along with the owner, Mr. Hochschild. Uh, because of our disagreement on this particular article in Nicaragua. It was an outrageous article that, that, that echoed many of the things that Ronald Reagan says about the Sandinistas. There were leftists at the time who were appalled at the Reagan administration's policy toward Nicaragua, but who also had no illusions about the Sandinistas, who certainly were not perfect social democrats. Some people might say that you can disagree with Reagan and also disagree with the Sandinistas. I guess that was too complicated for him. It had to be political, it had to be working class, it had to be about Nicaragua, it had to be about all these things. And of course, that's what gets buzz. And the political world wanted to see, you know, this terrible political uh, sin that had been committed against Michael Moore, when in fact it was much more an accumulation of smaller things. There was a budget of millions of dollars, there was a very specific schedule, and Michael wasn't used to that, or maybe perhaps not ready for that. For the first time in his life, Guy Saperstein, a well-known civil rights lawyer, crosses the aisle to defend Goliath, in this case, Mother Jones. The picture emerged um, very consistently that um, Michael was very non-collaborative, very insecure, very suspicious. He wasn't doing a good job of explaining the many confrontations he had with employees. It was more important for him to be quick and witty than to be thoughtful. Michael leaves San Francisco with a settlement of $58,000, only $8,000 more than he was offered initially. Jim Musselman is working for consumer advocate Ralph Nader when he gets the despondent call from his friend Michael. I was in Washington, D.C., and Michael was very depressed because he had just been fired and he didn't know what he was going to do. That's when I basically talked to Ralph that night, and I said, Ralph, you've got to give Michael a job. He said, usually, you know, I don't hire too many people. And, and I said, Ralph, I vouch for him, hire him. And Ralph said to me, okay, I'll do it. As it turned out, it was just the greatest thing on earth, you know, that they canned him, and, you know, he got a little money out of the deal because obviously paved the road for what uh, became his stock and trade. I thought Fahrenheit 9-11 was very insightful. I thought it was an excellent social criticism that was needed at the time. We are all Americans, however, we need to be critical of our government to make them do a better job. I think that he's really good at what he does. I hear from people that he's, you know, sort of twists people's words and, and stuff, but I think that his films are important and um, I feel that they bring up a lot of interesting points of view. Michael's security harassed my cameraman and refused to let him plug into the soundboard to get clear audio, despite the fact other cameramen are doing the same thing. I'm starting to think Michael Moore doesn't want us to make this film. I thought he liked Canadians. Continue to bother us, we're going to be asked to leave. 
That's what I'm being told. Well, all I know is you let these other people inside. Okay, I, I, I don't have the answer to that. I know I, the only thing I have the answer to is you saying no. I don't know why or anything like that. That's my final answer. I'm also being told if you continue to bother and harass us about it, we're going to be asked to leave. That's okay. harassment now. Okay. I was just asking. Yeah. Right? Okay. We have a few of our Republican brothers and sisters who joined us today. No, 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 no. Let's show them, let's show them we're not like them. We actually welcome opposing viewpoints at our rallies. It's not... You go to a George Bush rally, you gotta sign a loyalty oath to get in there. It's a party run by angry white guys. And if you turn on any of their right-wing talk shows or O'Reilly or Scarborough or any of those things on TV, and they're angry all the time, right? They shout, they're, ah, ah, shut up! No, you shut up, shut up! We'll be right back, shut up! It's, uh, and, and, you know, the reason they're so angry is because they know their time is up. I was absolutely disappointed. I was hoping to actually hear a platform from the other side. Though I am a Republican, I am an open-minded Republican. All today I heard was bandwagon approach and slander. I don't like hearing slander from either side, but this was an absolute insult to my integrity today. Have you seen Fahrenheit 9-11? I have not seen Fahrenheit 9-11. I'm a very sensitive person. I cried seeing Saving Private Ryan. I think Michael Moore was eloquent, articulate, and empowering to the student body here at Wayne State. It's called Roger and Me. Roger is Roger Smith, chairman of General Motors. And Me is the filmmaker, Michael Moore, who spends much of the film trying to see Roger Smith. The plot is Moore's unsuccessful quest for answers from Roger Smith. It was a documentary about my hometown of Flint, Michigan and what uh, General Motors did to the town. And so I go on this quest in the movie to find Roger Smith to see if he would come to Flint. Well, Toronto's answer to the Cannes Film Festival is now in full swing. The 14th annual Festival of Festivals is a 10-day movie marathon featuring 322 films from 38 countries. Back in 1989, we didn't know who Michael Moore was. Loved the movie, Roger and Me. We absolutely loved it, so it was kind of a rave fave inside the festival, which absolutely became a rave fave outside the festival. So we were all dying to meet this Michael Moore. Well, I, I'm kind of, I'm, uh, I kind of, I actually, I don't like documentaries, and... And in comes this guy who looks like a truck driver with a beer belly and the hat, and you go, I don't get it. How did this happen? I, I can't stand to watch PBS. Um, <clears throat> and I, you know, all these, when I first started, all these people told me about, you know, getting grants from PBS and all that, and I just thought, well, that would just, that would kill me right there. I rate Roger and me uh, absolutely the best, and that's for two reasons. I I'm, have a very soft spot for first films. That's, that's me. My mission was a simple one, to convince Roger Smith to spend a day with me in Flint. But I also have a really strong feeling about movies that have an enormous impact on what other filmmakers do from that moment forward. I wanted to show the destruction of the city uh, and how General Motors closed down the factories, why they did it, but do it in a way that was humorous and, you know, appealed to people on, on a, a level other than just, a, you know, a very serious uh, film. At that point, the film was such a hit that all of the buyers were jumping all over each other to get his name on the contract. And he kept on with the you know, the hayseed popping out of the teeth act and the truck driver kind of appearance. And we thought, well, wait a minute. Uh, who's the smarter one here? Because he's now jacked the price up, you know, to three, four, or five times the asking price. The progression, you know, from 50,000 to 100,000 to a million and a half to three, it kind of made sense. But only when you look at it as a whole. You couldn't really say at any one moment early on, yeah, we're going to get to three million. This was uh, that magic moment that happens in film then. He had been discovered. So his, everything was on the table for him. 
the stakes were very, very high. With the success of Roger and Me comes a critical rap that Michael is taking liberties with the truth and the chronology of events for greater dramatic effect. He's been found to have fabricated or invented or carpentered a number of distortions and um, outright lies into his narrative. No, stay with, stay with him. She'll turn out. In Flint, the local university theater troupe is rehearsing its play about Michael Moore. I'm sorry, guys. We seem to have lost the video feed. Let us continue live from the studio. While researching the script, the director discovers several startling fabrications in the film Roger and Me. Turn it up all the way. He talks about uh, um, a town hall meeting that's supposed to take place in Flint, in downtown Flint, where um, Ted Koppel and Nightline are going to come and cover this town hall meeting. When Ted Koppel announced he would interview city officials live in front of City Hall on Nightline. And then he goes on to show a news report where a reporter explains that that broadcast with Ted Koppel is not going to happen because the broadcast truck has been stolen by an unemployed auto worker. Apparently, though, just moments before the broadcast, someone got in the satellite truck and drove it off, cables and all. So now Nightline has had to cancel their segment from the city of Flint, and police are looking for a suspect. And the fact is that, that that's all actually completely fictional. He made up the news broadcast, he made up the theft, it never happened. He made up the actual town hall meeting. There's covenant, I do believe, between a filmmaker who calls himself a non-fiction documentary filmmaker and the audience that what you're putting on the screen, what you're saying is a fact, is a fact. And that includes the time sequences and everything else because that's the audience relaxes and says, okay, I'm going to accept what this man is telling me. I mean, I like his point of view. And in that case, uh, he didn't do that. He broken that covenant several times. He broke the taboo on people going to see a documentary in a theater. He made it sexy again. So the debate on what he has done to the documentary doesn't really interest me. What interests me is what he did for that form, getting it to the people, the masses, into the mainstream, 